What is up, my friend? Welcome to episode number 50, all about what is the state of being and how does it impact business growth? Now, this is a topic I don't think enough people are really talking about. And I've seen time and time and time again that it really has a huge, ginormous impact on one's life and business. So if you're ready to learn how to practically break through to a new level of success in your life and business, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Welcome to the Anthony John Amix Podcast, the one and only podcast designed to help you become unstoppable in life and business. My name is Anthony John Amix, my friends call me AJ, and my goal with this podcast is to help you remember who you truly are so you can maintain your center in the chaos, embody your potential, and unlock freedom in your life and business. That being said, let's get into today's show. All right, welcome back. Today I'm bringing you one of the guys who decided to attend Uprising 5 back in January of 2020. His name is Chad Schumacher, and he's the CEO and founder of a company called Allegory Goods, where they make these incredibly amazing handcrafted goods. I'm talking about like wooden pens, journals, wallets, bags, and like a whole lot more. And he and his wife, they started the company back in 2012 after the tech startup company that they're working at closed its doors. Now, Back then, the majority of his savings was like tied up into that company's stock, and it just kind of evaporated overnight. So the dude had to get creative. Now, he remembered that his father was making some of these like really cool wooden pins during his retirement years, and he was like, man, those are, those are pretty cool. So Chad decided to do some research, and he found some of these woods like the, that just had these crazy stories. I mean, stories like these oak trees that were like in this Ukrainian swamp and somehow they had fallen underwater. And instead of the wood being like this nice golden brown color, the wood was actually uh, kind of turned like this really dark charcoal black from the mud. And it, the thought of the stories that these woods that were, you know, they were carrying with them, that kind of led him to the idea of starting allegory. So he decided to then launch a Kickstarter campaign to then hopefully make enough money to just buy him and his wife some time while they just like found a job, yet it ended up being a lot more than that. It actually ended up being very, very successful. And so Chad and Allegory, they're all about looking deeper, looking deeper into the stories and into the people behind the things that we use every single day. And I witnessed some of the major breakthroughs and transformations that he discovered during Uprising 5. And so I thought, man, who better to bring on to the podcast to talk about what he sees is this thing called the state of being and how it has impacted his own business growth and hopefully how it will help you see how it's impacting the growth of your business as well. So now if you're a big fan of looking deeper, then you absolutely cannot miss my book called Mindset is Not Enough. It's all about looking at the subconscious that's you know, driving and dictating the majority of our behavior. And it's going to help you understand why you do what you do and also why you don't do the thing that you want to do. It will help you start to see what really keeps the vast majority of entrepreneurs from feeling like they're fully living into their potential and creating the amount of money that they desire and having the relationships with those that they love that they really want. So I've decided to give you the entire book for free. So all you have to do is head on over to ajamix.com slash book to download the entire thing for free. Again, that's ajamix.com slash book to go ahead and get that for free. Now, with that being said, let's go ahead and bring Chad onto the podcast. Chad, welcome to the podcast, brother. Hey. <laughs> Dude, I'm excited to have you on. Um, it's gonna be fun. I usually have like a whole kind of scripted flow and like, hey, this is where we're going. Today, I have nothing. <laughs> so we're just going to have a conversation. Um, man, I really want to talk about like being, you know, like you're like super um, successful, I think, compared to a lot of people. Like you create a lot of money, you create some big business you're married, you have children, uh, you're doing good shit, man. And you're Thank kind you. of being down the, like the path, like the being path as well as the business path. So I want to really talk about like what led you down the being path. Um, necessity. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, no, as I, as I, as I advanced, so I started out, I had a relatively successful career in marketing and business development in the technology world. And then um, uh, eight years ago, actually this month, so right, right at eight years ago, um, my wife and I decided to start a handmade products business and um, called Allegory, and that's what we're still doing today. Um, and so 
while I had marketing background, she had a lot of uh, operations management background. Um, we felt like we had everything we needed. And that was true, we did, but um, I never, I had no digital marketing or e-commerce marketing experience. It was all business to business um, and it was pre-digital. So, um, so the, their like traffic and optimization and all those kinds of things um, was not part of my world at that point. And we were also building a manufacturing company. Um, and so we had supply chain and all those other things to figure out too. So we spent the last eight years learning a lot of those lessons and getting on the course. In the meantime, we've had and raised two kids. Um, all of our parents have transitioned into, um, uh, into like their sort of elderly stage of their life, retiring and things like that. And we're both only children, so we're caring for all of them um, in various ways. So all that has come together over the last several years to mean that I'm super, super fucking stressed out a lot. Um, and, uh, and there were some kind of new stars and bumps in the road with the business journey that meant that, um, that I really needed to fix my relationship with my company. Um, you know, when you're running a company with your spouse, you know, there's a lot of overlap and like stuff gets messy there too. Um, so, uh, so I think it was about four years ago. Um, I, uh, I just happened to be Facebook friends with a mutual friend of ours, John Heston, and, uh, he had been, um, building his coaching practice. And I really liked a lot of kind of his message and what he was about. I liked that stuff wasn't watered down. I liked that there wasn't a lot of easy answers and bullshit. Um, and, uh, I got connected with him and, uh, and started that whole like, how do I put my brain back together so I can stay engaged and continue to grow my business? We grew really fast, got up to about quarter of a million, uh, 300K a year in revenue, and we plateaued and had lots of ups and downs, but have stayed in that range. And, um, you know, I could tell myself lots of stories about, oh, it's because of this business tactic that I haven't tried yet, or it's this other thing that I need to polish more. But ultimately, as I bounced around between all those different uh, methods, nothing was moving. The needle wasn't moving. Uh, or we weren't getting any happier. We weren't, we weren't experiencing any more peace or any more prosperity in our life. Um, and I've found over the last several, several years of doing more of this more internal work that at the end of the day, it's kind of up to me and who I am and how I show up in any of those environments or in any of those methods if they're going to work. So mm. I, that's a long answer to your question, but yeah, that's, that's, perfect, that's kind dude. of, yeah. What were some of the external things that you tried uh, to kind of get out of the, the plateau for business? Um, different market strategies, different product development ideas. Um, you know, oh, maybe we're playing in the wrong market space. Let's develop stuff for the photography niche and develop, you know, accessories for photography. Oh, wait, that's the worst launch we've ever had. Uh, that didn't work. Uh, maybe it's because none of our customers were... Uh, we're in the photography because we've spent six years building a building a niche around like business and you know uh, luxury products for professionals uh, in general and only some of them are interested in photography so now we'll pivot we'll try some other launch and we'll pivot we'll try this what, what if we set our funnels up like this what if we redesign our website well wait our product photography is not right you know so uh, or no it's a supply chain problem let's go let's go work on our supply chain and find new vendors and a lot of those things do help. And don't get me wrong. Like, I mean, uh, as we've sort of tried to optimize the business for scale, we've reduced like our leather cost by 30 or 40% and got a lot more reliable supplier there. But it probably took me a lot longer to do that because I was scared of losing the supplier I had. So at the end of the day, there was an internal fear hurdle there that was slowing down the growth too. So we tried, we tried a lot, basically anything that you could try. It's been eight years. We tried anything we could figure out. Um, and ultimately what it's come down to is, uh, you know, we need to level up the way we're showing up so that we can make more confident decisions. Nice. And have you found kind of that blend between the being and the doing is kind of the thing that moves the needle in business? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, cause, cause as part of that journey, I definitely have gone through phases where I'm not very present at work because I'm sorting shit out for myself. Um, and in myself and you know the needle didn't move a whole lot during those times either but 
those little detours were really valuable because then when I jumped back in and started getting my hands dirty again, uh, I was I was choosing the right things to work on. I was showing up the right way in those various business relationships to get results. So yeah, that kind of stuff. Nice. What have you found like, um, or let's, let's ask this question. How would you define being? Because I think lots of business owners are like being internal work. That's spiritual shit. Like, I don't need to do that. How would you define like what being is and how it impacts business? Defining what it is is a whole call on its own. Um, (laughs) But in terms of how it impacts business, I think I can tell a quick story that will, um, that I, that I think will help. Um, So like one of the things we've tried is uh, obviously buying traffic for your website is, is a fundamental of our business, right? And we've tried doing it ourselves, and we've tried outsourcing it to different people, um, and none of it's worked. And what I what I realized uh, at, at one point here from doing the internal work was that I was showing up freaked out about spending money and losing money, and cash flow and everything else. And there were real concerns in our business about cash flow. You've got inventory to buy anything else, but. Ultimately, the way to engage with that kind of stuff is to invest consistently and optimize over time so you get better results. And I never really dove into that. Um, So it didn't matter if I was doing it myself or what strategies or tactics I was using if I turn the campaign off after six weeks if it's not doing what I want. And if I fire whatever vendor after six weeks if they haven't already gotten results, it doesn't matter if... uh, if, if I have the perfect vendor and I went through three or four really good ones. Um, so that was the journey there. And then uh, recently after kind of attending an event, you know, the event we, we met at um, and really digging in on some of this stuff, I was able to create an opportunity with a, 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 whole, a whole different type of media buying with a media company that has their own website and their own subscribers and their own users. So it's not even like about a dashboard and an ad campaign and whatever else. It's a whole different way to drive traffic. And I was able to create a relationship with them that, you know, we think has the potential to drive ten to $15,000 a month in incremental revenue. Awesome. Um, because I showed up without fear into that relationship. I cracked the right joke at the right time on the call. And that relationship got super strong really fast. And, you know, they're giving us discounts on pricing packages to pilot stuff. They're investing extra time in connecting with us around how to optimize their website and optimize the back end of the campaign. And, like, there's this deeper relationship that got created because I showed up fearless and showed up as myself instead of, wait, are we going to get results right away? I need to know if we're going to get results right away. I got bills to pay. The bills come every month, you know. Like, that energy doesn't start those, those growth relationships off in the right tone. So... So on one hand, yeah, it's all got to show up on the bottom line. And, and you could make an argument if you want. It'd be a stupid argument. But you could make an argument that all this investment in people is bullshit. But people are what drive your results. And you as an entrepreneur are what drive your results. So if you're not willing to invest in yourself or in your people so that they're showing up right with the right knowledge and the right mindset and the right like, way of being, like being, being the success that they want to create, um, you know, it is, you're, you're not going to see the results no matter what levers you, you pull. Yeah, it makes sense. And you mentioned that you came to an event here in Dallas, which was Uprising 5. It was an event Jonathan and I hosted. I think it's, it's, it's a very different event than uh, that's on the market. It's something actually I'm really proud of. How have you found that to impact you? You, you? I mean, part of this is coming back, it sounds like, into the game of fearless, but what was that whole journey like coming to Dallas, going through Uprising 5? It's super nebulous. It's super weird. It's super crazy. How'd you find that process? Yeah, I mean, we could get into the mushroom trip level stuff of like what I experienced while I was there, but, um, but. And by the way, there was no mushrooms involved for those listening, just letting you know. Yeah, there's no And the reason I say that is people, people ask me, they're like, is there plant medicine involved? And I'm always like, no, there's no plant medicine at all. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, the experiences there, while they created some really, uh, crazy ways to explore myself and, and stuff like that. Um, no, there was no, uh, no drugs involved. Um, but it was, uh, I mean, 
one of one of the one of the easiest things is I I haven't been able to sleep without some kind of a uh, medical health prescription or whatever for uh, two to three years because of anxiety around work. And since coming back from that event, I sleep like a baby. That's so awesome. Um, our you know our business has experienced a lot of clarity around our long term strategy. Um, because I'm, I'm more able to engage with the uncertainty that it takes to commit to those long-term visions. Um, my family, um, you know, gets to spend more time with me being myself instead of being trapped in anxiety. And we have more fun. Um, I've been able to share what I've learned with my family and hold space for them as they connect with parts of themselves that weren't healed and weren't getting attention. Nice. And I've seen them have some of the same growth and, and, um, and transitions, which has been really healing for me um, and allowed me to kind of feel like I'm retaking my leadership role in my household. Um, not that I feel like the guy always has to be the leader or anything, but as the guy who started the business that feeds us and lives on our property, I, that's kind of in my family anyway, there's some element of that. Totally. There's a lot of back and forth, but anyway, um, like, I, I guess I felt like in the moments where I'm called to, where I do need to take a leadership role in my household, I can do it now uh, in ways that I kind of, I would do it, but I would do it like on baby giraffe legs before and not really inspire a lot of confidence and peace in, in, in my family. Um, and they would follow me out of love. Now they follow me because it's, when, when I ask them to, when I need them to, they follow me because it's easy. Awesome. Because um, they can trust me and lean on me. So... Um, it's transformed relationships with my, uh, my extended family too. Like I mentioned, we care for, um, care for, uh, older folks, uh, my parents and my wife's parents. And, um, so going to doctor's appointments, helping them navigate difficult medical decisions, but also creating personal boundaries with them so that those relationships aren't big drains on my ability to do my work in the way that they work. Um, so, so yeah, lots, lots of stuff. Nice, man. Nice. What do you think are some like the big mistakes that a lot of entrepreneurs make in this game? Oh, um, so many, uh, <laughs> but that's the, that's the beauty of it. I mean, I would say some of the biggest are um, believing that there is an objective reality about whether your business is viable or not. Um, one of my favorite things to tell an entrepreneur that's just starting out and is worried about, can I make this thing happen? Is this business idea good? Can I make this business work? Um, first of all, I talk about like, there's guys who make, tons of money dressing like a clown in Times Square. Like you can, you can, anything can be a business. It all depends on how big of a business you want to create. Like if you're trying to pay your bills and that's your goal and you have your own personal financial goals, like maybe pay your bills and you know, X, Y, Z, just about any business can get you to that point. Uh, if you commit to it hard enough. And, and, uh, and instead of thinking about, people tend to think about market share, like can I get X percent of the market I always flip that around, like, how many customers do you need to pay your bills? Like, because it's probably a few hundred or maybe a couple thousand, or maybe, you know, if you have a, if you have like a more entry level product and there's not great margins, maybe you're, you know, maybe you need 10 or 20,000 people. 10 or 20,000 people seems like a lot, but that means that the world is literally full of billions of customers you don't want or need. So, uh, so your game then as a, as a business owner is not about like trying to meet some objective criteria. It's about how can I approach my business in a way that every day or every week or whatever the, whatever the time scale is, I'm putting one more person on that list of customers that I need to make my business viable. And, um, you know, and in the context of this conversation, one of the main things that I think people overlook, um, is that they think the solution to that is outside of themselves. They think the solution to where I'm gonna find the 10 or 20 or whatever number of customers it is that I need must be outside of me. 
Like I, it can't it can't be that I already know ten people that'll buy what I want. It can't be that um, that just me being who I am is going to be enough to open the door to people hearing about what I do. Um, and of course, of course it is. Um, you ultimately are the are the biggest difference maker. You know, um, you can look at five you can look at five different McDonald's franchises with different owners and different management, and they'll be performing completely differently. And you can make excuses and say, this one's in this town and this one's in this town and there's three McDonald's that's competing with that one. They got a Burger King next door or whatever else. But I bet dollars to donuts that when, by the time you dig into it, you're gonna find that the, the, that the person and the people are what's really making the difference between how those businesses thrive or not. Because I will like I will drive an extra few blocks to get to a better restaurant all day. If if I have really awesome customer service every time I walk in there and the energy is good and the food's right and the orders and mistakes aren't made or whatever, and that's a that's that and I just use that example because that's a really easy way to like level the playing field and take the whole is my business viable out of the conversation. Totally. There's a there's a place here in Dallas called Sebastian's Closet. They it's like a men's fashion boutique place. It's owned by. Uh, three guys uh it's the dad the son and then the dad's brother's uncle right mm -hmm. and, and so the, i could go to nordstrom's and shop and essentially get the same clothes but i go there and pretty much pay double what it costs at nordstrom because the people are so awesome they're just so amazing now don't get me wrong their clothes are really well done and they tailor everything there and but their customer service is like the best ever it is so good like so good. Mm -hmm. So I love that you're saying like customer service, man. I think so many people are dropping the ball on taking the time to really build out like just a ridiculously good customer service experience. And if yeah. you do that in today's marketplace, I think you stand like heads and shoulders, like Goliath level minus the head chopping off by David, but like this right. giant level heads of, of, of people, man. Yeah. I mean, we, the, like we went years without spending much ad money on brand and we relied on that we um we did a we did a kickstarter campaign we nailed we did everything we could to nail the experience for those people and we did another one and another one and you know before long now our website's organically doing several thousand bucks a month Amazing. um and and a lot of that has to do with the fact that we have a, a ridiculous guarantee you know, if you don't, if you don't like it for any reason, whether it's reasonable or not, we're going to take it in return. If you use it for five years and something doesn't work, we're going to, we're going to fix it. Um, you know, where most brands would be like, you got five years out of it. What the hell else do you want? Like we, sure. you're founded as a company on a longer term relationship between the customer, the product and the company. Nice. And um, yeah. And here, I've got a really good example. Sure. And isn't Doc Martens like that? You know, the shoe? I remember like buying those leather shoes with the rubber, I guess the rubber soles. And I, I remember that um, if they ever come unstitched for some, for any reason, at any point in time, you could send them back and they'd just send you a, a new pair of shoes. Yeah. I mean, for me, it was actually, I would, it, uh, when I was coming out of college, I sold Cutco knives yeah. for a little while and they had that guarantee. And because they were using kind of a door-to-door -door sales model, people were a little bit suspicious of them. So they came front and center with that guarantee and said, listen, this is the last one you're ever gonna have to buy. We're gonna fix it or replace it forever. No questions asked. Here in America, you know, with craftsmen and people you can, you can count on. And we've already been in business for X years and we're gonna be here when you need us. And I, so I saw firsthand what that would do to people's perspective. And especially in today's market with so many temporary products yep. and, uh, and really shitty customer service experiences, um, people are conditioned to expect that shittiness every time they buy something. They're like waiting for it. Um, so it actually generally will take us a couple back and forth conversations with them before they realize, wait, these guys aren't going to just pass me off to put me on hold and whatever else. They're actually here. This is a human being that wants to support me. Yeah. And, then the, and then the light goes on and... We generally, so now we're to the point where customer complaint is an opportunity to build a long, -term, like super long-term relationship. Like people are like, oh, I got my thing and it's the wrong whatever, or, you know, there's this mistake on it that you really should have caught. And, and they write us this big, long treatise, like, because they're used to having to have the perfect argument and having to like, just bother the shit out of the company to get what they want. 
and we respond on the first email with, great, here's a return label. Uh, thanks for noting your concern. And then we give them you know, like five or six, you know, other things to consider while we're working on this. Is there anything else we can do right, you know, for you and whatever else. And it totally like some of our longest term customers that have spent the most with us over the years are ones who we started off on the wrong foot with and then mm. we were willing to fix it. It's amazing. Um, and like I, the, the example I was saying, um, I had this, this, this right here is a, is a inline chlorinator for a pool. Okay. Yep. This, um, the, these things uh, on Amazon are 70 bucks and mine broke this weekend. And I have a store around the corner for me that has them in stock. Uh, and I could, or I could get one on Amazon and have it to me the next day. The store around the corner for me was $135. Amazon was 70 bucks. And I'm like, I really want to support these guys. They answer their phone. Every time I have a problem, they tell me how to fix my pool because there's like five, if you don't own a pool, there's like 500 things that you have to do to make these stupid things work. Like, it's not just, so, so, um, so like these guys answer the phone when something breaks, they help me with things. Uh, and so I called him up and I was like, Hey, uh, you know, this is kind of weird, but I'd rather do business with you guys than Amazon, but there's a 60 bucks. You guys are almost twice as much. Can I give you a hundred bucks for that thing? And I happily paid him $40 more than Amazon. And he was happy to get the support from somebody who, uh, whose business he would have lost. And that's one more step deeper into that relationship that I am with this little store. Awesome. So next time something else breaks from my pool or whatever else. Right. And that's, yeah. that's cool stuff. And a lot of, I, I imagine a lot of folks listening to this podcast are in different spaces than that. But that concept, like, that concept translates. Like, it's about how you show up and it's about the relationships you create. Yeah. And you, and you can talk all day about, like, oh, the business is bottom lines and business is this and business is that. But at every transaction happens between two individuals, period. Sure. Well, I think when a lot of people get like complaints, because I know um, some people's like deepest fear is like, what if they find out I'm a fraud? What if they're not happy with my service? Oh, and they're carrying all the stress. And it sounds like for you, you, and I don't know, we can dialogue about it. But when you get the feedback, you're just like, oh man, we get to like make this right and deepen this relationship rather than taking it as a personal attack that you're not good enough, your company's not worthy, your product shit. Like all of this stuff that we've been, you know, most people would create from a customer feedback of like, Hey, um, this isn't, this isn't right. So how have you gone through that transition from not taking it personal and just understanding, Hey, this is just a game and I'm going to come in here. And I'm going to rock these people's worlds. And as a result, we're going to deepen the relationship and we're actually going to turn this into a win. How did you come to that like conclusion? Um, well, I had the benefit of the experience of seeing that work. And like I mentioned, the Cutco stuff and other stuff before that. So I had the benefit of that experience. But I do want to say that every time it happens, I still have that fear and that, and that, that imposter syndrome bullshit script plays. You know, we're, uh, like we're a leather goods company. And uh, a lot of the stuff we do isn't in line with what a traditional leather worker would do um, because we have different tools and we're self-taught. Um, we certainly can't compete with what a product looks like on day one with, uh, with a, a Chinese manufacturing operation that is super duper repetitive, like everything is the same. Like if you line up 10 of the same product of ours, every one of them is gonna be a little bit different from each other. And you can interpret, it's very easy to interpret that inconsistency as a mistake. And frankly, I'm sure, fine, it's a mistake. Um, but the difference between us is, is then what we do afterwards, right? So, so, you know, every time that customer complaint comes in, yeah, I feel, Jesus, we can't, we can't, we can't deliver what some of these other companies are delivering, you know, we're, maybe, maybe, maybe we really should outsource. Maybe we should do, like, I, I have to struggle with all that stuff every time one of those happens. Um, so I don't want to, I don't want to paint the picture that I'm invincible from that. Sure, of course. Um, but being able to step into that fear and say, okay, yes, that's true. Yes, there are things that I can still learn and grow and things that we're still getting better at as a company. It's also true that that's true of every company. There is not a company on the planet that isn't trying to be better tomorrow than they are today. And, and there's not a person on the planet, I don't think, 
that's not trying to be better tomorrow than they are today. So you can look at those, those things about yourself that aren't there yet, or the things about your business that aren't there yet. And you can say, these are all the reasons that I suck. Or you can say, this is where I'm at on my journey. And it's also true that there's all these other things that are great. Like the fact that we've shipped 1.5 or more million dollars worth of stuff that we made in our garage to people. And most of them really love it. Yeah. And, and all, the, all that stuff is true too in that moment when you're getting that feedback. And it's really easy for us to get latched on because I think people are generally pretty empathetic and we latch on to the energy that we're getting from the customer, which is you suck, you suck, you suck. But we need to know the bigger picture and lead in that moment and say, yeah, hey, there's some stuff about me that sucks. I made a mistake on that. I could have done a better job on that. Or this is an area where we're slowly improving. Or maybe, hey, this is not something that's a priority for us. This isn't me. Here's what I'm about. If this is a fit for you, great, let's do business. If that's not a fit for you, then this isn't, then you're one of the billions of customers that I don't need. And that's fine. And I wish you the best and I hope you find the perfect vendor. Um, so that's, I guess that's kind of what that journey is like. I, 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 I sort of picked that way of doing it initially. I just chose that's, that's how I'm going to do this. We're going to, we're going to turn these into opportunities, these moments into opportunities. And we're going to, and we're going to go above and beyond for people. Um, and then from there, having to stand in that moment several times and wrestle with the shitty comment that I got on Facebook or the bad review on Amazon. Or, um, you know, the email that comes into customer service and explains why we shouldn't exist as a company and it's four pages long, right? Like, um, I, I, I sit with it. I take it and I, all right, first, first question, what could, what, what could we have done better for this customer? Where do we need to just eat shit and apologize? Second question, um, you know, how do we turn this into a powerful moment where we build a relationship? And third question is, what else is true? What else is true about us and about our business so that we can still remember and lead from a place of we provide massive value in certain areas? That doesn't mean we're perfect for everybody, and it doesn't mean everybody that touches our product has a perfect experience. But, you know, let, let, let's go talk to the guy who, uh, who sent us the walking stick that he went on a five mile walk with, with his daughter and uh, when she was a kid and then sent us that walking stick so we could make her a pen when she graduated and got her MBA. Awesome. Like, I don't think, I don't think the, co the Chinese company that you're talking about that you wish I was right now, I don't think they could do that shit. Right. Exactly. I don't, and I don't think that they can have a conversation with the father that, that lets him trust a family heirloom to be cut up into pieces and turned into something else. Like those are things about our, about our company and about our brand that, yeah, we're like, we're not coach and we're not the $20 version of our stuff on Amazon from China. We're neither of those things. And both of those are established and they're very successful. And maybe that means that we'll be a small company for a long time, but I'd rather be a small company that's built on super strong customer relationships and people actually knowing us and knowing my name, like when COVID hit, we got a bunch of emails. They weren't, where's my shit? They were, how's your dad? And I, I make journals and pens. Like this isn't like I have one-on-one -on -one contact with these people all the time. We, we, you know, one, one time last year, we had a delay in shipping a big batch of products to people. And we had to say, hey, sorry, we were dealing with family health issues right now and we're a small business. And you know, A, when that happened, we got a bunch of support back from them and said, family first, we're, we can wait for our stuff. And B, months later, when this stuff hit, they were like, wait, Chad's dad is older and he's got health stuff. I bet this is a big deal. These are people I've never met. I've never had a phone call with them. But we have a relationship around a product that we bonded around. So I don't know. That's, that, that, that's the journey for me is, 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 it starts, it starts with just the decision and the commitment to see that opportunity. And then, and then in the moment, you've got to be willing to take the hit and absorb it and not bullshit your way out of it. But then also remember all of the other things in your brand, your company that are, that are awesome and that yeah. give you standing to be in that moment lead. And then you lead that customer into a, into a deeper relationship. Dude, I love your process for this. I want to go deeper. 
So this is kind of the mindset process of handling it. How have you found to be like that internal being process of dealing with it? Because I, I think somebody could experience the same thing, have the same mindset piece, but they're still holding on to the fear and the imposter thing. We all experience it no matter what level that we're playing at. But how have you found to kind of shift out of that back into a place of power to then be able to deepen those relationships? Um, so I'm going to give you a super honest answer. Um, awesome. I have it. What I generally do or have done until recently, um, until we've started doing the work together that we've done and, and stuff like that, is I just suck it up and I bury whatever else is going on with me so that I can get the right email together that I know checks all the boxes I just listed for you yep. to respond to the customer. And then I spend a week kicking my own ass. Mm. Um, that's probably the honest answer to that question. Now, I'll still work or whatever, but like, but like those words will hang on and they'll, they'll, right. They'll, they'll chirp in my ear for the next few days. So I, I guess at a being level, um, it, it wouldn't be an integrity for me to say that I have a clear process for that. Mm, thanks for what, sharing what, that. I, what I've noticed is that as I get more integrated and healed at that deep being level, right? Like as I shift out of the way that I engage with the world being to prove or defend that I'm here or that I have what I have, and I shift into a place of feeling worthy at a deeper level, what I notice happening is that that chirping in my ear doesn't last as long. And that, and that it goes away more quickly and I can get back to work with a clear head more quickly. Mm-hmm. But, um, but yeah, I think that stuff sticks with you no matter, I, I don't care how like deep you are um, into the personal journey, Somebody, somebody says you're full of shit and like you sold me this product and you're a scam artist or whatever. Like you're like, um, and in our case, it's usually people that didn't even buy this stuff. It's like people posting on a Facebook post or ad about well, who, the, who the fuck wants to spend that kind of money on a pen? And we're like, well, not you. Bye. Um, but for the next week, then in the back of my head is who wants to spend that kind of money on a pen? Yeah. yeah. Why are you charging so much? What makes you think that your, that your stuff is that valuable? And this is after having sold over a million dollars worth of stuff to people yeah. that are happy with it. I'm going to go second guess that whole pile of a million dollars of business for the next week because Frank from South Carolina didn't like my Facebook ad. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and I, I don't have like a, let's not listen to Frank. Um, I hear Frank, Frank, Frank hurts. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm, as, as I do the work of healing those parts of myself at a deep level so that I can show up the way I want to, I also notice that, that Frank's voice gets quieter faster. Yep. And I think that becomes the real game where sometimes yeah. we used to be maybe derailed for months and then we're able to do some deep inner work and those months turn into weeks and the weeks turn into days and the days turn into minutes and the minutes turn into seconds. And it's this lifelong journey of just getting better and better and better and becoming a master of just shifting out of the shit faster and faster and faster and starting to see the Franks from South Carolina as the gift of like, man, thanks for the opportunity to remember my awesomeness of how amazing we are about how crafts like master craftsmen we are. Thanks for helping me remember that you're not my customer and that I create it for a whole nother segment. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to fucking remember. Thanks Frank. And by the way, fuck off. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. 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 So that's, I mean, that's where I can, that's where I still have some growth to do. And, and uh, I look forward to settling into that. Um, you know, for now, I think I've, I've turned days or weeks into a day or an hour. Nice. So um, good. And I can go ahead and take that hit um, and get back to work. Uh, and yeah. Yeah, and it's generally I also find too that it's not that person, like I because I don't care about Frank from South Carolina, but Frank from South Carolina starts to sound a lot like fill in the blank person who I actually do respect, my dad, whoever, right? Some somebody that I actually do respect that said sure. something similar, and then I'm oh they were right, right? 
oh, I really am a piece of shit. And that's, that's when it, that, you know, that's when, so going back to the relate that, that core relationship with my dad or with whoever else who's been judgmental about me in the past, but healing that wound, that just takes a lot of the charge out of that moment with Frank from South Carolina. Yeah, dude. If you could go back in time and give yourself some like wisdom that you have now that you think that would help your younger self be able to collapse some time and generate the millions of dollars in sales quicker, what would you tell him? That's a long list. Uh, <laughs> a long list. <laughs> like people to avoid and like, projects that were bad ideas and stuff like that on that list um but i I don't know i guess it where i'm at right now in my journey though a lot of those things that i would typically put on that list like man i wish i hadn't fucked up by stepping on that landmine or whatever a lot of those landmines taught me stuff that like and opened the door to things that i am not sure that i would want to live without in this moment um I've got deep scars from this journey, but, uh, but I don't know if I'd pick a different one if you offered it to me. Um, so I don't know if I'd tell them anything, but the, but I guess, let me say one thing that I would tell them is you're enough. Like you don't, you don't need a revenue number. You don't need approval from your parents. You don't need approval from your wife. You don't need, uh, you don't, you don't even need this. I mean, I'm fortunate to still have a long and thriving marriage and we have every intention of, you know, growing old together, but like, you don't, you don't need a wife. You're enough. It's who you are. And I think, Probably for me at that stage, another thing that I, that I probably should have emphasized that I don't need is a plan. You don't, you don't need to have it all figured out before you move. You need to move. Um, you, you, you will learn and grow a lot faster by going out and getting some skin knees and bouncing off of stuff and making mistakes. Kyle C says this book, I really hope I screw this up. Actually, I haven't read the book, um, but I, I know Kyle's work pretty well, and the title was enough. <laughs> um, like, the, like, oh, wow. Like, in failure, we learn and we grow. And, you know, a lot of really successful entrepreneurs, like Steve Jobs and others, have said uh, the, the big difference between your the levels of success of different entrepreneurs is their willingness to fail and get back up and keep moving and not much else not much else really so um so that's uh that's the that's the thing like you you just have to be willing to fail and get back up so i think I think fear of failure uh, and you're enough would be the two big messages that I would send back to awesome. the younger version of myself. Dude, and people want to learn more about your company, they can go to allegorygoods.com, but can you get like give them a rundown? I know you guys do pens, journals. Can you just give them a quick rundown of like what you guys do and how you can help the professional people there? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, so where most luxury brands are about like proving you've arrived, uh, Allegory is about uh, not having anything to prove and believing that the journey is more important than some imagined destination. So that's the core value of like where we create from. Um, some of the stuff we create are uh, journals, uh, pens. Um, uh, the pens are generally, we try to infuse a story into everything. So the pens might be made with wood from the deck of a World War II battleship or a beam from one of the first buildings built after the Chicago fire. Um, you know, we, we source our leather really thoughtfully and there's a story there too. Uh, for the different leathers that we use. Um, and, uh, and then everything we make is, is guaranteed for life. Um, and we make it for people, for individuals, but also for brands. So we have a lot of relationships where we do uh, uh, corporate gift orders for dozens or even thousands of, of uh, customers. 
Um, and we've worked with some of the top brands in the world on that, with Kraft Foods, the Obama Foundation, um, others like them. Um, and, but we also really love connecting with a small brand, you know, on five or 10 special gifts for, for clients that mean the world to them as well. Um, so we do, we do that kind of stuff. Um, and we can also, uh, for any business professional, whether they're buying for their company or not, um, we can give them something in their pocket that makes their day a little bit more meaningful and reminds them who they are every time they pull it out. So Awesome. So if you guys want to go grab a journal, grab a pen, something that's super cool and just like unique and, and awesome, go to allegorygoods.com. Chad, thank you so much for being here, brother. Uh, awesome. I really appreciate you. Thanks, dude. Thank you, man. Well, there you have it, my friend, Chad Schumacher of Allegory Goods. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and I hope it really helped you to better understand like what your current state of being is and how it's impacting your life and business. Now, when I first started this whole podcast, my goal was to help business owners understand that there are two pedals to this bicycle of purpose and profits, and those two pedals consist of the doing pedal and the being pedal. And it seems like many people are like attempting to get to their top of their chosen mountain of success only using one of the pedals of their bicycle. And typically for high achievers, it's kind of like the doing pedal, the marketing, the sales, like go do things. And then for those who are like spiritual or maybe they're into personal growth, it seems that they're typically trying to just use the being pedal. Now I'm here to tell you that it's not either or, it's both. It's both the doing pedal and the being pedal. And when you start to leverage both of these pedals, achieving your version of success is a lot more fun. And I'm here to tell you, it also doesn't have to contain so much stress and pressure. There's like a whole new level of opportunity to create some big ass success while feeling free and fulfilled and happy. And that doesn't mean that it's that way all of the time, but your ability to shift out of the shit and get back into a place of power just becomes quicker and quicker and quicker. And I hope my conversation with Chad really helps you to see this. So thank you so much for listening to this podcast. And remember, I'm over on Instagram posting all kinds of really good stuff to help you break through to a new level of freedom, purpose, and success. So when you're done, please head on over to Instagram and follow me there. You can find me at, at AJ Amix. It's A-J-A-M-Y-X over on Instagram. So that's going to do it for this episode of the Anthony Johnny Mix podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Until next time, my friend, I'm out. Peace. Well, that's all I've got for this episode of the Anthony Johnny Mix podcast, but we have plenty more to help you become unstoppable in life and business. So head on over to AJAMix.com for exclusive resources information and tools to help you break through to a new level of freedom, purpose, and success. I look forward to having you back for the next episode. Bye for now.